Today we're going to start chapter 8, which is about the stimulus control of behavior. As a little bit of a disclaimer before we get started, most of what we're talking about is going to be framed under the guise of instrumental behavior, so looking at instrumental conditioning or operant conditioning. But a lot of these concepts, a lot of these ideas, can also be equally applicable for classical conditioning. So just because we're only really talking about instrumental behaviors, don't think that it only applies to instrumental behaviors. That's just sort of how the chapter is set up. So that's my beginning disclaimer. But we're going to start today by talking about some of the basics of stimulus control. And then in the next lecture, we'll kind of get into a little bit more of the details of that. But we'll see how far we get today. Now, as the name implies, the stimulus control of behavior is when different behaviors fall under the control of different stimuli. Basically, we're saying that you perform particular behaviors at appropriate times. You can also say that you're performing that behavior when a particular discriminative stimulus tells you that it's appropriate to do so. So when those certain stimuli are present, it says that you are okay to do that behavior, or doing that behavior now uh, would be reinforced. So as a good example of this, um, you could get away with wearing a bikini at the beach. No one would think twice of it. But if you wore one to class, then that would be a little bit weird. So there are uh, discriminative stimuli that say that bikini at the beach is fine. That's where we would see bikinis. But class is not a place that one would wear a bikini. Um, so it is an inappropriate time to exhibit that behavior. For more naturalistic examples, we could talk about foraging when there's no predator present, um, but not foraging when there is a predator present. That calm environment with no predator would be a discriminative stimulus that says it's okay to forage right now. Um, but if there's a predator present, then that's a different stimulus that tells you it would be a bad idea. Um, and you could also look at things like uh, when it's appropriate to drink or uh, whatever. So while a lot of these are sort of less specific behaviors, things like foraging or outfits or whatever, um, a lot of what we're going to talk about will be things that we've previously been talking about in terms of behaviors, things like checking a key or pulling a lever, um, just because those are a little bit easier to frame in terms of the concepts that we're talking about today. As we find throughout most of this course, a lot of our scientific research tends to focus on more narrow um, behaviors just because they're a little bit easier to control. On that topic of how we might want to set things up to look at them experimentally, we might want to ask how we can actually measure these control stimuli. How do we actually ask animals or um, human infants, uh, individuals that cannot speak to us, that can't actually tell us what's going on, how can we ask if two stimuli are different from one another? How do we actually pull apart this information if we can't physically ask about it? Psychologists have been interested in how organisms identify and distinguish between stimuli for pretty much as long as there have been psychologists. And this idea of being able to tell the difference between different types of stimuli has, uh, is very tightly linked with the idea of stimulus control. As a quick example of that, if we use from the previous page, we have our stoplights, green and red. In order for these to have different meanings, in order for one to be a discriminative stimulus that tells us it's okay to go, we have to be able to tell the difference between a green light and a red light. And we can use either the color or the position or a couple of other different features to tell these apart, um, but we'll kind of delve into some of those factors as we move through the rest of this lecture, because we're going to be talking a lot about how we can tell the difference between different stimuli. And that brings us back to this idea of how we actually ask uh, animals if two stimuli are different from one another. So let's consider a very simple example. We have two cards. One is blue and one is kind of blue-green. And we have a fairly simple experimental question we want to ask. 
can organisms tell the difference between these two colors? If you're asking this question of, say, university level students, it's pretty easy to set that up. You could show them both of the colors and ask, are these the same or different? And their response would tell you if they can perceive a difference in those two colors. You can complicate it a little bit more and add some controls and things like that, but for the most part, it's a pretty basic question. But if we wanted to ask the same question of infants or pigeons or rats or whatever, you can't just ask them. So we'd have to set up a situation, a paradigm, in which we could present those two colors and something about the way that they respond could tell us if they perceive them as the same or different. And this idea of having a difference in responding between the two colors, if they can tell the difference, is the concept of differential responding. So we see variation in responding that corresponds to a variation in stimuli. Um, so we actually looked at an example of this earlier on in the course. So maybe you remember our experiment with the habituation to visual patterns in infants, where we showed infants either a very complex or a very simple pattern, and we looked at their looking time. How long did they pay attention to those two patterns? We saw that they would look for longer at more complex patterns, and that they would look for shorter periods of time at simpler patterns. And that is, by definition, differential responding. They're responding differently to those two stimuli. If the complex and the simple patterns were visually identical or perceptually identical to the infants, then they would have looked at both for the same amount of time but they didn't, and so we can make an inference that they perceive a difference in those two stimuli. And if you are differentially responding, that means that you are discriminating. You are discriminating between those two stimuli. So we can talk now about stimulus discrimination where you respond differentially to two or more stimuli where you can have differential responding to multiple stimuli. And this all links back to that idea of stimulus control, because if you do not discriminate between the two or more stimuli in question, then the behavior that you're doing is not under the control of those stimuli. So if there is no discrimination, there is no stimulus control. And that's why we're going to talk so much about discrimination, because it is so tightly entwined with this idea of stimulus control. Now that we've established some terminology, let's swing back and talk a little bit more about traffic lights. Um, and what I kind of got ahead of myself saying earlier on. But if you think about a traffic light, most of us would use the color of the light as a discriminative stimulus. If the light is green, it means that we can go. If the light is red, then we would stop. But if you think about it, people who are colorblind, specifically red, green colorblind, they can't rely on the color of those lights to tell the difference between needing to stop and needing to go. However, colorblind individuals are still able to drive their cars. They still know when to stop and go at a stoplight. So they're using some other feature of that stimulus. Instead of just relying on the color of the traffic light, they could be relying on the position of the light. They know that the light at the top is the green light and it means go, and the light at the bottom is the red one and it means stop. So there are different aspects of these stimuli that could be what's controlling the behavior, meaning that an organism could be paying attention to any or all of the different features involved in a particular stimulus. So we can encounter stimuli that have multiple different dimensions that we can pay attention to. And of course, researchers have been interested in which features the uh, organisms that they're studying are paying attention to. So we're going to look at one very a uh, sort of traditional study done by Reynolds back in the 60s, where they first asked what specific part of this stimulus is the pigeon paying attention to? So we could also frame that as 
what about this stimulus is actually controlling the pigeon's behavior? What's controlling their responding in this scenario? So this experiment is going to be an example of how we can experimentally determine which stimulus instrumental behavior is under the control of, or which part or aspect of a compound stimulus is controlling the behavior that we're looking at. So we can start with this experiment where they trained a pigeon to peck this compound stimulus. So we have a red circle and a black uh, triangle. So this would be a standard operant box setup where we would have a key that lights up. It's uh, red with a triangle in it, and if they peck this key, they get food. And so we can ask ourselves, are the pigeons pecking at the red circle, or are they pecking at the black triangle? But we can ask this question by actually testing uh, what the pigeons peck to. So we can say, okay, are they actually pecking the triangle, or are they pecking the circle? Is it the entire stimulus being encoded as one single unit, or are they treating it as two separate elements and they're choosing to focus on one element or the other? Are they choosing to focus on or pay attention to the triangle, or are they focusing on the circle? And if we look at the results for this study, we actually see that the pigeons do show differential responding. They respond more to one of these stimuli than to the other. So even though they were trained on the compound stimulus, they would respond more to one and they wouldn't really respond much to the other. But the cool part is that different pigeons showed a different preference in their picking. So here we have pigeon 107. They did not peck at the triangle, but they did peck at the circle. So in this case, we would say that their pecking behavior was under the stimulus control of the red circle for this pigeon. However, pigeon 105 showed the opposite pattern. They were focusing on the triangle. So the triangle was what was controlling their behavior. So we see differences in which feature they chose to pay attention to. They have different features or different elements of that compound stimulus that were controlling their pecking behavior. This tells us a couple of different things. Um, so in no particular order, this does tell us that they can encode the individual elements of this compound stimulus uh, separately. So this circle with a triangle can be encoded as a circle and a triangle as two separate elements because we see different responding to those two different elements. We also find that because this experiment wasn't set up to direct the bird's attention to one feature or the other, that there wasn't any innate preference here to pay attention to the circle or to pay attention to the triangle. So because we haven't told them what to focus on, they would each have their own individual differences. We'll talk a little bit later about certain features that tend to overshadow others, where maybe a certain color or a shape or something would be more salient and would be easier to encode, in which case most organisms from the same species would have a similar pattern of discrimination. Um, but here where we're seeing two pigeons with two very different responses, they do show that differential responding, they just show it in different directions, so there's an individual difference here. Let's look at a different example. Um, and I think I've already shown you guys the example of chickadees in an operant box, but we're going to use it to frame a slightly different idea this time, so we're going to go over it again. So by now we should be comfortable with the idea that stimulus discrimination refers to responding differentially to two or more stimuli. The previous example was looking at pecking keys that were either circles or triangles. Now we can look at a different example, which would be an operant go, no-go procedure. So instead of having to choose between two possible options, in a go, no-go procedure, your choice is to either do a behavior or withhold doing that behavior. So if you do the behavior, you go. And if you withhold that behavior, you are not going or no-going. So with our chickadees in an operant box, 
they would sit on this perch, they'd break an infrared beam, and this time, instead of our example, I believe, with shaping, this time, because they're sitting on this request perch, it tells the computer to play a sound through this speaker. And if the bird then wanted to display a go behavior, if they wanted to choose or perform the behavior that corresponds with a particular stimulus, they would go into the feeder. They break the infrared beams in the feeder and the food cup rises. If it is the correct choice. So if uh, they're supposed to go to the feeder, if a sound plays and it's a good sound, going to the feeder gets them food. If they're supposed to withhold responding, maybe there's a different sound, or maybe no sound is playing at all, then they should not go to the feeder. The correct response would be a no-go uh, behavior. And so we can set up an experiment where maybe we want to see if chickadees can tell the difference between a uh, 200 kilohertz, uh, sorry, a 2 kilohertz sound and a 4 kilohertz sound. So we would train them to go to a two kilohertz sound. So a tone would play when they sit on this perch. And if they go to the feeder when they hear a two kilohertz tone, then they would get food. Um, and then maybe we wanna see, okay, do you think that a four kilohertz tone is the same as a two kilohertz tone? So they could play a higher pitch sound and see if the chickadee goes in the feeder or not. And we'll kind of revisit this idea throughout because we can talk about things like gradients of frequencies or even gradients of color. Um, so again, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but this is another paradigm, another setup that we can use instead of just having to choose between two keys that are presented. You can have this go, no go setup where your two possible options are going to the feeder, or withholding going to the feeder. Now, we've talked quite a bit about stimulus discrimination, being able to tell the difference between two stimuli. But we're going to look at the other side of the exact same concept, and we're going to consider stimulus generalization. So instead of treating two stimuli as different, what happens if you respond similarly to two or more stimuli? So generalization would be a failure to discriminate between two stimuli, or if you treat two stimuli as similar or the same. The famous example of stimulus generalization is, of course, baby Albert, who was trained to have a fear response to a rat. So a small, white, fluffy rat. And eventually, after learning to be afraid of that rat, baby Albert generalized and became afraid of anything that was white and fluffy. So it wasn't just rats anymore. Now he would be afraid of, say, a Santa Claus hat with the pom-pom on it. That could also be considered afraid. So even though we might think of those two stimuli, a rat and a hat, as very, very different, to baby Albert, they were treated similarly. He had generalized to respond to both of those stimuli as the same. So he would have a fear response to both because they were treated as the same. Now, when we talk about stimulus generalization, we tend to think about them in terms of generalization gradients. And there are a couple of examples of these in the textbook that you can look at as well. But what we're looking at here is going to be a graph of our responses, so our behavior on one axis, and then on the other axis would be some feature that our stimuli can vary along. So this could be a quality that we can vary between different stimuli. So really, really common ones would be wavelength if we wanted to vary color. If we wanted to use my chickadee example, we could use frequency if we wanted to vary our pitch. You could vary size, you could vary shape. Um, pretty much anything can go along this axis as long as it can vary in a continuous way. So that's how we're going to get our gradient, is by considering our responses along a variety of uh, uh, different levels, I guess we can call them, of a particular feature. 
So let's use the standard example of wavelength. So we're going to start by training pigeons to peck at a particular color. So in this example, they've labeled our peak here, and it says that our CS is a 530, I think this is nanometer. The uh, diagram at the bottom is kind of fuzzy, but I think it's nanometer. Um, so 530 nanometer wavelength. Um, so that's what the pigeon would be rewarded or reinforced for pecking. So you have a pigeon in an operant box and they could be shown a color or maybe a key lights up a particular color. And if it lights up this specific color, they get food. So you set it up originally to train them that this is their condition stimulus. This is the key, this is the color that you peck to get food. Then what we want to do is exhibit systematic variation, where we can slowly consider um, different colors. We can present uh, longer wavelengths and shorter wavelengths. We can go uh, sort of down here. They've measured as low as uh, 470 nanometers and as high as it looks like 590 nanometers. And what they want to do is measure the rate of responding for each of those different wavelengths. And the idea with a generalization gradient is that because the pigeon was uh, trained to peck for a very specific color, they should peck the most to that specific color. And as we get further away from that color, as the color becomes less and less similar, we should see less and less pecking. Now, these generalization gradients don't just show us generalization. We can also frame it to show us uh, discrimination, because as I hinted at before, generalization and discrimination are just two sides of the exact same concept. So using this data here, we could say that the pigeon generalizes um, between our 530 nanometers and, say, 520 and 540, because they're also responding fairly high to, uh, to wavelengths that are similar to what they were trained on. So they're gen generalizing or treating those wavelengths as similar to what they were trained on. We could also say that the pigeon is discriminating between different colors, between different wavelengths, because they respond more to what they were trained on, and they respond much less to wavelengths that are dissimilar to what they were trained on. So we can see both generalization, where they respond uh, more to things that are more similar to what they were trained on, and we can see discrimination because we see that they respond less to things that are less similar. So that's why they're uh, sort of two sides of the same coin, the same concept, but framed slightly different. Now, what might we expect if there was no stimulus control? If this behavior wasn't being controlled by a particular stimulus? The textbook uses the example of what if we had a colorblind pigeon? where the pigeon couldn't tell the difference between these different wavelengths, where they all just looked like the same intensity of light and the color didn't matter. Then we would see non-differential responding, basically pretty much equal responding to all frequencies or to all wavelengths, because we're talking about light, it's wavelengths, sorry. Um, but we'd see pretty much a flat line. So we don't see that peak from the previous example where we see the most responding to what they were trained on and less responding as we get uh, sort of further and further away from that. With no stimulus control, they can't tell the difference between these different um, stimuli and we see non-differential responding, meaning they treat all of these different colors as the same. We can also compare different curves and look at our degree of control. So here we have two very different um, generalization gradients where we have our purple one where our curve is very spread out. So they respond to what they were trained at. Here we have a 550 is our CS. Um, so our peak is at 550 for both of our curves here, but if we focus on the purple flatter one, that curve 
um, it shows pretty high responding for a lot of different frequencies, or sorry, a lot of different wavelengths. I'm so used to doing this with sounds. Um, but because it's very flat on top, they're responding a lot to 550. They're still responding a lot to 540. Even 530 is still pretty high. So there's a lot of generalization here. And we can say that there's also a lot less stimulus control because of the amount of generalization here. Because this curve is so flat, they're kind of responding a lot to everything that's even close to what they were trained on. In contrast, our ugly brown curve is a lot more pointy. We see tons of responding to that 550 nanometers, but to the, uh, to the wavelengths that are even just a little bit above and a little bit below that frequency, we see a massive drop off. So if we go and look at 540, we're seeing a significant decrease in the amount of responding here. So we're seeing a lot more discrimination here and a lot less generalization here. So we can say that this curve is showing a lot of stimulus control because we see tons of responding specifically to the wavelength that was being trained, and we see a lot less responding to anything different from what was being trained. And these curves can be sort of as pointy or as flat as you can imagine. They can vary from sort of this pointy, um, this uh, sort of flattened out point, um, or we can even get something that's completely flat. And they're all just telling us how much discrimination is happening or how much generalization is happening. And that gives us information about how much stimulus control is going on as well. And from experience, I know that it can be pretty difficult to frame what um, the differences between discrimination and generalization. And even though we've had a couple of different examples, I just want to use one more to see if I can help that concept sink in, because this is absolutely something you're going to need to know for an exam. But if we wanted to look at discrimination, that's being able to tell the difference between something that's telling us to stop and something that's telling us to go. We know that this one is telling us one thing and this one is telling us something else. So we would exhibit completely different behavior to those two stimuli. We treat those stimuli as different. So we discriminate between those two stimuli. Generalization would be that we know that a black traffic light and a yellow traffic light and even the weird horizontal traffic lights, they're all telling us to stop. So we would react to all of these different kinds of traffic lights by stopping. So we'd show the same kind of behavioral response to all of these different stimuli, even though they're not identical even though they have slightly different orientations or different colors or whatever, we can still generalize our behavior. We can still respond the same, even though the stimuli might be slightly different. So that's just one more way that you can try and frame generalization and discrimination. All right, the next section of this chapter starts talking about factors that are involved in stimulus control. Now, these features can be involved in determining the degree of stimulus control that we can obtain. They can determine which specific feature of a stimulus gains control over that instrumental behavior. They can determine the ease of conditioning, so the type uh, uh, of stimulus that you're using or different factors related to that stimulus, they can all affect ease of conditioning. So. There are more things that could be considered, but we're going to focus on sort of the big factors that seem to be mostly involved in stimulus control. Just be aware that this isn't an exhaustive list. We're just sort of picking the ones that are most important. So let's start off pretty easy, and we're going to talk about sensory capacity. With the way that we've been framing these questions, a lot of what we're asking is, can an animal tell the difference between these two stimuli? So when we're looking at stimulus control, we might be asking a question about what they are physically capable of perceiving. So can an animal actually see color? 
So if we go back to my example at the very beginning, talking about telling the difference between a card that is blue and a card that is blue-green, if you have a colorblind animal like, say, dogs, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference. But if you have animals that are capable of perceiving color, then maybe they can. You might also have to ask questions about their resolution. How dissimilar do stimuli need to be before they can physically tell the difference? So the sensory capacity of an organism can actually set a limit on which stimuli can actually control their behavior. So a lot of times, very early on in studying a particular species, you really need to set up experiments that determine what an organism is and is not capable of perceiving. So if you start using a new type of bird that's never been studied before, well, maybe you have to figure out what their range of vision is. What are they capable of seeing? And we'll look at an example of that on the next couple of slides. Um, but we can also think about uh, hearing range, or even if they're able to see enough detail to discriminate between two different kinds of paintings or something like that. So if there's a feature that can vary, you want to make sure that your organism is capable of actually perceiving those differences. So if we wanted to check if an animal can actually see colors, then maybe we can set up a discrimination and ask them to um, sort of pick between two different colors. If we want to know if somebody's colorblind, then present them with red cues and ask them to only respond to red cues. What happens once they've been trained to respond to red if you present them with green? If they still respond, even though it's green, then they see red and green as the same, and they can't discriminate between those two colors. We found a limitation of their sensory capacity. If we wanted to establish what the hearing range is of a particular species, we might get them to discriminate between the presence and the absence of an uh, acoustic cue. So maybe we would tell a dog that when they hear a sound, they should pull down on a rope. And we would present different frequencies of sounds. And if they stop pulling on the rope, even though we're playing a sound, then maybe that sound is outside of their sensory capacity. Maybe it's higher or lower than the range of frequencies that they can hear. And these are actually the kinds of experiments that have been used to establish things like those charts that you would have seen in your intro textbook that shows the different hearing ranges of different species, or what uh, frequency of light different species can see. Those would all be set up using experiments like this. So let's actually look at an example of how we could do this. And this is an example that isn't in the textbook, but I think that it's really, really cool. So I wanted to take just a minute to talk about. In an experiment done by Smith and colleagues back in 2002, they wanted to establish what two different bird species were capable of seeing. And so they wanted to look at Japanese quail and European starlings. Now, I'm not quite sure of the background here, but my assumption would be that they probably wanted to use these species in a different experiment, but these aren't standard model species. These aren't pigeons. These aren't zebra finches. Um, these aren't the usual avian model organisms. So there's probably a very limited amount of knowledge on what these species are capable of perceiving. So this experiment helps them figure out what they can and can't tell the difference between, what they can and can't see. So they trained these two species to discriminate between two different types of visual stimuli. So for our first experiment here, oops, okay, so for the first experiment, they wanted to see if the birds could tell the difference between two different colors. So they have these teeny tiny little tiles that they had set up with different visual stimuli. So these are about a centimeter and a half squared or about an inch square, and they had red tiles and orange tiles. Now they can set this up so that different groups would be reinforced for responding to different stimuli. So group A could be given food for responding to red, 
and group B would be given food for responding to orange. So once they've been trained up, we can ask, do they generalize or do they discriminate between these two stimuli? So what happens if the group that had been trained to respond to red is given an orange stimulus? Do they treat it differently? And same if they had been trained on orange, do they treat red differently? And they would train uh, both, um, so one group with red and one group with orange, just so that we make sure that there isn't any kind of bias or preference or anything weird going on. You always want to consider sort of both sides. Um, but in both cases, they ended up finding that the birds could be trained up to discriminate. If they were trained to respond to red, they responded to red and did not respond to orange. And that held even if they were shown new red and orange tiles that they had never seen before. So they knew that they were paying attention to the color and that they could tell the difference even when given new tiles that they had no experience with. Now the cool part, at least in my mind, is the fact that they repeated the experiment using not just red and orange, but UV and non-UV tiles. So if we look at these two tiles at the bottom here, they look exactly the same to human eyes, and that's because humans can't see in the UV spectrum. However, if our birds were set up and trained in the same way that they were with our colored tiles, where one group would be trained to respond to UV reflecting, and one group would be trained to respond to non-UV reflecting, and then when we asked them, um, is there a difference by showing them the other option, we would see that they'd respond to what they had been trained to respond to, and that they would respond less to the thing that they had not been trained to respond to. And so the birds were capable of detecting the difference between UV reflecting and non-UV reflecting, which means that these birds are capable of seeing and discriminating in the UV spectrum, even though humans can't. So prior to this, there was actually, um, I guess before we knew that birds could see UV, you would think that uh, we'd miss a few things in our experiments. I think the biggest realization I had was the fact that pretty much all birds can see in the UV spectrum. So even the birds that look really boring and plain, like the chickadees that I have done research on, if you look at them through a UV filter, they often have really cool feather patterns that us humans don't perceive, but other birds would be able to perceive. Um, and so I just found that it was interesting that our human-centric focus on research, we actually ended up missing a huge part of like what birds pay attention to because we didn't necessarily think of looking at UV. Now, I don't know off the top of my head if this was the first study that looked at UV reflectivity and ability to perceive in the UV range, um, but 2002 is fairly recent in terms of bird literature, so there was probably studies before this. Um, this is just one of the nicest setups to see this uh, idea of generalization and discrimination, so I figured we'd uh, wander off on a tangent a little bit here. All right. The next on our list of factors that can control or that can be involved in stimulus control is orientation. And this is kind of another simple idea, which is basically, are you looking at the thing that we're focusing on? Um, so you can ask, what is the organism looking at? If an animal is going to use a particular stimulus, um, if a behavior is going to come under control of that stimulus, then the animal needs to be aware of the stimulus. So we just talked about, are they physically capable of perceiving it? And now we're asking, are they looking at it? Is it something that they can be aware of? Because if the stimulus is occurring, say, behind them, or if they're not paying attention to it, then it doesn't really matter and it isn't going to be controlling their behavior in that moment because they're not aware of it. So this is kind of a logical idea, but we do need to talk about it because if you don't consider it, you can miss out on some important factors involved in stimulus control. As I've said, when it comes to nature, things are a lot more complicated. 
But when we're in an operant box, we can control orientation to make sure that that organism is paying attention, or at least facing in the correct direction of the stimulus that's going to be presented. So at the bottom here, we have a pigeon that is using a touchscreen. And in most of the research, this is um, a touchscreen is kind of the newer version of just having pigeons peck keys. And it's because you can have them peck a item that's being displayed on the screen instead of being stuck to whatever keys are in your box. So same basic setup, just a little bit more technologically advanced. And because of that extra technology, a little bit more variable. But with these screens and even with keys when we were using the older boxes where you'd only have say two keys that they could peck there would usually be some kind of behavior that the pigeon would have to do to let you know that they were ready for a try so in a touch screen like this here we have two different stimuli and this pigeon is being asked to discriminate between them the image on the left versus the image on the right before these two stimuli that they're being asked about would show up, there's usually a little box in the middle of the screen where the pigeon would have to peck. And that pecking action would basically tell the computer, I'm ready, show me a try. And we use something very similar with our chickadees, where at the beginning of a trial, a chickadee sits on this request perch. And breaking that infrared beam on the perch tells the computer to play a sound. In both cases, that initial action isn't really involved in the discrimination process, but it's important because it ensures that the animal is ready for a trial and that they're facing in the right direction, that they're prepared for the presentation of that trial. So with pigeons, by pecking the screen, they have to be physically facing the screen for their beak to touch it. With the chickadees, if they're sitting on this perch, they're at the optimal position near that speaker to hear a sound that would be played. So we can design our experiments to make sure that our organisms are oriented in the correct, correct direction, that they're ready for a trial, so that we don't mistake, say, something like disinterest or being distracted as not responding. Um, so, as always, we try and control as many factors as possible. Now, the next concept or factor that we're going to talk about is ease of conditioning, which ties into overshadowing. But looking ahead at the slides, this is actually a fairly long topic and it would take quite a bit to explain. And we're just about halfway through the slides here. So I think I'm actually going to stop here for today and then we'll pick up with ease of conditioning for Thursday's class and then keep on through types of reinforcement and type of response as well.